Everybody showed up. We like 20 people showed up, you know, thank God. And, and, and I was all energized because I had a word from the Lord. That's what a word from the Lord will do. You energize. You ready to, to leap over the walls and run through troops. You ready to go down and, and go down to hell itself and just snatch the victory out of the devil's mouth. Until life comes. <laughs> You are driving down the road of faith and you run into life. Right? Well, life runs into you. And then what it does is, I keep using this car analogy, it challenges the integrity of your faith. Do you not know that whether or not you walk away from an accident is very much dependent upon the integrity of the vehicle that you're driving? Some of y'all need to ride in a tank and you riding around a little Yugo. You know, them little Fiats. You riding around them little, you know, little push cars and you got, you got a little push car faith and you need to be having, you need to have a brother Jeff truck. So that when there's a collision, you don't want to come out on top. You know, that's a good analogy because his truck is so big, if something come at him, he just ride right over top of it. <laughs> He just, he just, he just, he just, just put in that four wheel drive, drop down that gear, just rock right over top of it. And that's what your faith ought to do. Your faith ought to be big enough. It'll be, oh yeah, it ought to be monster truck faith. It ought to be such that you can walk right over top of whatever obstacle that's in front of you. But it just not, it's just not always that way. Sometimes your faith is just not, you not, you're not there because reality. See, what, guess what reality is also locked into? Reality is locked into your history. It's locked into your past. And, you're in, and the enemy will try to remind you of what things have been in the past. How many know that every one of you all have a button? Am I talking to anybody? You got, you, got, you got a bunch of buttons. You got some things that all you have to do. I got, there's some people, and I'm, I'm learning this. You know, I'm learning this about myself. I have learned that there are certain people that I cannot be around. I'm, y'all not helping me. I'm going to talk. I've learned. I'm going to go to a scripture before this is all over because I do have something to say. I've learned that certain people can, I can't because all of a sudden, just their aura and their presence takes me to, take me to another place. I can walk in, hey, yes, yes, God is good. You know what? I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can get through this. Oh, I'm I'm on top. I'm going to slay mountains. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm uh, and God's going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And you get around one person like, I I don't know. Lord, are you still here? God, you need to evaluate that. If you can be around people, around a person, and you go in one way, and you come out another, and it's not good, and it's not better, and if somebody has to look at you and say, what happened to you? You need to cut that person off. How many of you have ever had that experience? Am I talking to anybody today? That's the Lord warning you that you got to try the spirit by the spirit. That you can't be around everybody. You can't, you can't be around every situation. It doesn't mean how close they are. Doesn't have anything to do with who they are, but if there's a negative outcome, if you come out of it with a negative outcome, it's not of the Lord. It is not of the Lord. It is not, am I talking to anybody? Amen. Because they are dream snatchers, they are dream killers. They are faith snatchers, faith killers, people who, who just don't want to see that progress and want to remain to have that control over your life. And I'm I'm preaching hard right now. Amen? So you got to keep yourself in the sphere of when your faith is being fed. You got to feed your faith. You have to continue to feed your faith. And continue to, and you do it by the words that you speak. And by the words that you confess out of your mouth. And you keep walking by faith and not by what? Am I talking to anybody? I'm dealing with this whole challenge today. And you know, you know me, I'm going, I'm going to use the challenge of the moment to preach about. 
it, 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 I'd be crazy to do anything else. This day is a challenge. It is a challenge. It's a challenge. And it may not be a challenge for you because you're going to get up and go to work tomorrow. All right? You're going to get up and go to work tomorrow. I don't care how bad it is. You're going to go to work tomorrow. But this is my work. And it's like the business is being shut down. And you come, you only get so many days of work a year, and then, and you know, it's like having a whole, you know, whole week of work gone. You know, something's happened, the work gone, no income, no nothing, you got to still pay the bills. This is my work. You understanding? It still, still has to go on. So there's a challenge. There's a challenge. There's a challenge for all of us that how do we respond? And all I'm doing is taking the challenge of the moment and trying to relate it to your life. That's all I'm doing. I'm trying to relate it to you so that it is not just my challenge. You know, you're, this may not, you, you won't, this, thank you, Holy Ghost. There is no way that you as church, and those that are listening, that you can feel this particular challenge the way I do. There's no way. I don't care how close you are to me. There is no way that you can feel it. You can empathize and you can sympathize and you can even support it. But you won't feel it the same way. But you have your own challenges. You have those moments when your faith misleads you. Right? It's not really, but it seems that way. It seems as though the direction that God's taking you is different than the direction that you thought you were going to go. Remember we just talked about that with Israel coming out of Egypt? How the Lord took him what? The long way took them all the way around through the wilderness of his will and took them in a whole different direction as opposed to taking them the shorter way because what he was doing was preparing them to be able to permanently occupy where he wanted them to go. Had he taken them the shorter way, they would have gotten there, but they would have been destroyed. They wouldn't have been ready for it. And some things God wants to take you to, you're not yet ready for. What I have to believe is that all this taking place, everything that's going on right now, there is a purpose in it. There's a purpose in God. I have to understand that closed doors are not denial, but just redirection. Sometimes God shuts doors to direct you into his will. And you sitting there, I'm going to knock, and it shall be up. No, the Bible says God is the one that opens the doors, God is the closer. Behold, I open the door, I present to you an open door that no man can shut. But if he shuts the door, no man can what? No can open it. So sometimes you're knocking on the wrong door. By faith, this door is going to open. Not if God closed it. If God closed it, if God shut it off, you know, hearing what I'm trying to tell you. If God has done that, because sometimes, and even with people, let me walk this through one more step. Sometimes, even with people, God will shut off relationships. It's taken me a long time to come to this revelation. Am, am I helping anybody this morning? It's taken me a long time to understand this particular revelation because I didn't think it was true. You know, because certain things, you know, our, our, our doctrines and our thought processes, especially when there's people that's close to you. And when there's people that's close to you, you, don't, you, you can't believe that because sometimes your love for people can get in the way of your obedience to God. I didn't say your love to God. I said your obedience to God. Because you're trying to rationalize why it is that way. You're, you're trying to save the world. And I may, you may, it may seem like I'm going around a circle, but I'm going to end up in the 11th chapter of the book of Romans before I get done today. But you're trying to save the world and I'm going to tell you, look at somebody and say, you can't save everybody. Jesus didn't even try to save the world. Because matter of fact, he, he to, all he told the Lord was in, in John chapter 17, he said, I have kept them that you gave to me. Yeah. Them. That means the particular group of people that you gave me to have influence over, Jesus said, I've had the influence over those people. 
Because if I, he's, but his point is, if I influence those people that you've given me the influence, then they will influence the ones that they're supposed to influence. That's how it works. Jesus was the first one that was involved in network marketing. He was. Y'all don't see that? Jesus was the first person to be involved in network marketing. And I'm not trying to promote anything. I'm just telling you the truth. Because he started with one guy with an idea. And that was Jesus. And he got 12 around him, really starting with three. Started with three, Peter, James, and John. They were the main three that he had, that he revealed himself to. They were the one that got the revelation. They were the closest to him. Out of that three, that three broke out into 12. And from the 12, there was the 70 that walked with him, that the 12 taught and went out with. And from the 70, there was the 500. You got it? And out of the 500, it was 120 that ended up in the upper room. But then 120 come out of the room with the new assignment and the new product that they're now selling, and all of a sudden that 120 go to 3,000. And then that 3,000 goes to another 4,000. Then all of a sudden we got a movement that has been going on for 2,000 years. And do you know why? Because he wasn't just with us, he was in us. You got it? He's now in us, and he's now. Now all of us are saying the same thing, Jesus saves. That's what we're selling, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in other words, there's certain people you're supposed to influence. You can't have every single person in your life. Not everybody, even some people in your life are detrimental to your life. Am I helping anybody? Am I helping anybody? Because not everybody's feeding your faith, right? You need people telling you that you, that you can do it. People telling you that you're a winner. People that telling you that you can make it. And you also need people who, who are going to be honest with you, but who challenge you and be honest with you based upon their best interests for you, not your best interests for them. Am I helping anybody? How many of you have ever been connected to people like that where they really... The advice that they give to you is based upon what's best for them. And sometimes you can't tell the difference because it seems so sincere. And it is. But at the end of the day, it's going to benefit them, not you. How many of you have ever, I'm, this is a little question for you. How many of you have ever had the closest people in your life just simply say to you, what is it that will make you happy? They always tell you what's going to make them happy. Y'all got real quiet on me. I remember one time, I remember one time, and I'm going to, I'm going to get to this text. I remember one time my mom, um, after my father died, we had gone through this great debate um, about where she was going to live. Um, 3911 Dorchester Road. Was, was basically the house I grew up in. Camille grew up in. Barbara was there for a little while, but, but there, was, there was a sentimental value in that house. That's the house that Susan came to, you know, when Edward found her. That, how Edward lived in that. There was a lot of sentimental value. And even when I drive past it now, there are so many memories. There is, that was my life. That was, there was so much that was connected to that house. But that was a big house. And it was a lot of memories. You know, my dad was all through that house. He remodeled it. He redid it. He tore it apart. Didn't always put it back together. <laughs> it would be nice if he tore it apart and put it back together. My father was determined, because it was an old house, and so it didn't have showers. Had big porcelain bathtubs. We had, we had, we. I think we were the first one, of the first people that had like three or four bathrooms in one house. We had bathrooms side by side with pantries on the side and dressing rooms. This is the truth. That's how we were living in the sixties. We had dress. My mama, my mama had a whole room just to put her hats in. You know. And so, as my father, we had a third floor upstairs, and and. And my father made up, the, you, had, you said to go up the steps, around this little tiny corner, and up another set of steps to go up the third floor. Me and Camille had a fight on those steps one time. <laughs> it's the last time we fought, because she, she used to beat me up. 
because I was younger than her, and she used to always beat me up and then sit back and like she just laughed just now. <laughs> She'd sit back and laugh. And so she got at me one time, and I was about 13 to 14 years old, and I was a little stronger, and I hit her. I caught her. Bam! And knocked her down those steps. It was over. We ain't never fight again. That was it. We never, we never fought again. She's like, oh, okay, all right, you can handle this now. She so didn't beat me up anymore. She started kissing me after that. But anyway, my father decided he wanted to have a shower. And so instead of, you know, it was a big bathtub up there, you know, it, it was, it, it was a you know, cloth foot tub. It was a really nice tub. It was, it was the kind of tile on that floor where you had the, the, the little um, octagon tiles, then you had to put that stuff down like one by one. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. And so, and back then they had these big one-piece showers. Y'all remember that? The whole thing was all one plastic, or it was fiberglass, Rick. It was fiberglass. And, and it was all in one piece. So he couldn't take the tub out, but the shower couldn't get up the steps because of the landing, right? And because of the turn. It was too big. There was no way to get the shower up the steps. So you know what my father did? He got a saw and cut it in half. He cut it in half. Y'all you know, I'm telling you the honest to God truth. He cut it in half and then got, a, got it up there and tried to use glue to put it back together. <laughs> glue and tape on something that's supposed to hold. There's a lot of memories. I'm going to my mama. I have forgot where I'm going. It is the truth. He was the first guy I ever saw work on a toilet with a hammer. <laughs> some of y'all, some of y'all don't get the joke in that. A, a toilet is porcelain. You don't hit a toilet with a hammer. You put a hole in the floor, you walk in the bathroom, you go in the bathroom, you can see down to the kitchen. <laughs> a lot of memories in that house. A lot of memories in that house. That's where all the Christmases were, all the Thanksgivings were. I'm going somewhere now. Many of you that have been around cooking a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of memories in that house. And so after he died, nobody wanted to let it go. Stay with me now. I think I'm not going anywhere. I'm going somewhere. After he died, nobody wanted to let it go, right? Nobody wanted to go. And these two definitely didn't want to let it go. They let it go. And, and, and that one right there, the sentimental one, that one right there, she, so she's telling mama, no, we can stay. We can stay. And so I went to my mother, and I asked her, hey, this, this is where I'm going. I said, mama, I said, what do you want to do with the house? She said, and you know what her answer was? Well, Barbara wants to do so-and-so. And Camille wants to do so-and-so. And Marcus wants to do so-and-so. She went through the whole family and told me what everybody wanted to do. And I stopped. I said, wait a minute. What do you want? She looked at me and she said, it was like this, this eureka moment. She looked at me and said, baby, nobody has ever asked me that question. She said, nobody ever asked me what I wanted. Your father always gave me what he wanted me to have. He never asked me what I wanted. It's like she just unloaded. Because she realized in her whole life, nobody asked her what she wanted. That she, her life was being geared in such a way to be happiness for everybody else. And guess what? It was so intrinsic into who she had become that now she made that her happiness. Y'all not with me right now. That she now made other people's happiness be the substitute for her own happiness. So as long as you were happy, she was happy. There's something wrong with that picture. Y'all better help me preach up in here. 
You know, long, as, long as, I, as long as you okay, that means I'm oh, no, no, but I'm really not okay. But because you okay, I'm living vicariously through you, so I'm okay. No, no, I'm not okay. I don't like this house. Oh, God, I don't really want to be in this house. There are too many memories for me, but I'll stay in a place I don't want to be. I live a way I don't want to live just because it makes you happy. The devil is a liar. Y'all don't think I'm preaching, but I know what I'm saying. Uh huh. He that the sun set free. See, Jesus understood this day. His family tried to manipulate him. He came and they said, your mama and your daddy, or your mama rather than your brothers and sisters are outside. They want to see you. He said, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who am I? He said, those that do the will of my father. Those are the ones that are my brothers and my sisters. In other words, he said, those who are going in the direction that I'm going. Finally, when I talked to my mom and I asked her what she really wanted, she finally said she didn't want to stay there. She finally said, I don't want to stay in this house. There's too many memories here. But had not somebody come to release her, she'd have been bound. She probably would have died sooner. You hear me? Because the pain and the memory would have sapped her life away when God wanted her to live. <sighs> Help me, Holy Ghost, to get this out right. You can't a shantakara masa. There's a word of God that says godliness with contentment is great gain. I want y'all to stay with me for about another five minutes because I feel the Holy Ghost now. You can't live unhappy. You can't live unhappy. You survive. You can get through life. But you can't be what God called you to be and created you to be and be the best at who you're purposed to be unhappy. It doesn't mean you like everything. I feel your Holy Ghost. It doesn't, because Paul said, I know how to abound and be a base. He said, I know how to be up. I know how to be down. I know how to have. It has nothing to do with what you have and what you don't have. It has how you look at yourself. Because Paul, the Bible says, Paul said, I think myself happy. Even when my ship is being wrecked and I'm about to go up in front of Caesar, knowing I'm about to lose my life, I still think myself happiness. Because I can't live unhappy. Unhappiness will, will drain you. It will sap you of your energy. It will take away the will to get out of the bed. Don't think I'm not preaching because I know I am. It will take away everything that you have. And the Lord says, I would that you prosper. Be happy even and be in good health. Even as your soul prosper. If you read the, the, the amplified version of, 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 I mean, will I put up for me the, 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 the John 10 and 10 in the amplified version? I want, you to, I, want to, I want you to see this very, very quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Am I, am I talking to anybody? See, sometimes your life has been so, so jacked up and controlled by others that you don't realize that there's supposed to be a happiness for you. And I'm not talking about some... Some, some crazy, we're blissful. <laughs> no, no, no. Life's not ever going to be like that. When I'm talking about where you just generally feel good about you, you find moments of happiness. The thief comes only to do what? Steal? Uh huh? And just read it and says, What? I come that they may have and what? Enjoy life. Everybody say, Enjoy life. And have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. Woo! Touch somebody and say, I give you permission to be happy. <laughs> Y'all don't realize how powerful that is. Now touch yourself and say, I give me permission to be happy and to enjoy my life. Hallelujah! And you can do that and still be in the will of God. <laughs> you can enjoy your life 
and not be, you know, and not, not be outside of the will of God. You can enjoy your life. And part of your enjoying fact, now, when I get to this, part of enjoying your life is to be in your purpose. It's to understand the purpose for which God has sent you. Right? Right? We got a snow day outside. It's snowing. It's going to turn to ice. It's going to be bad. I got to let you all go. We got about one-fourth of the congregation here this morning. Right? I know where the money is. We don't have any money in the bank. It's all gone because we haven't had church in three to four weeks. And people don't make up for what they don't do. I'm trusting God for it. But trust me, right now, in my purpose, at this moment, I am no more happy than I am at this moment. Because I'm in my purpose. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Now, you check me about an hour from now, it might be a different story. <laughs> I might be going to the movies, you know. Now, I said something. I said something today. I got, I got to say something today. Somebody came in my office. I walked, I looked out the window. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm paraphrasing what I'm giving. This is my disclaimer. I was joking. Everybody say he was joking. I think. <laughs> Cookie no came in the office. Somebody said, Hi, what's it? how you doing or something like that? I said, I think I need a drink. I, I, it wasn't that bad. I, I, told, I told him this morning. It wasn't real bad. But I told him. I looked out the window and I said, oh God, what are you doing to us today? God help us. That's the reality of life. That's how, you feel that some way sometimes. But God wants you to enjoy your life. And, and, and one of the things, I mean this whole thing about, about living a blessed life. And having, and having, and the Lord said to me, I give you permission to be happy. And, and I know that I'm not going very deep with this, but here's the point that I want to make, is that we don't realize how permission is stolen from us. Jesus said, I've come again that they may have light. He said, the spirit of the Lord is anointed, is upon me because he's anointed me to set at liberty those who are in captivity. And let me walk this through for a moment. Some of y'all think that's captivity to sin. No, it's captivity from you being who you're supposed to be. When you're locked up in a prison, you can't be the real you. You can be a great mind in prison. But if you're a great mind in prison, you can't get out and function the way you were supposed to function. Amen? When Jesus came to save you, let me give you a little theological point here. Jesus came to save you is not because you were lost. Right? Because you know how I said, I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Y'all remember that? Oh, he's a wonderful Savior to me. So wonderful. He's a wonderful Savior to me. So wonderful. I was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in. He's a wonderful Savior to me. Don't we sing that? I'm saved by his power divine. Saved through the life now divine. Life now is sweet. My joy is complete. For I'm saved. 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 I found a friend. Who is all to me? His love is ever true. Ooh, ooh. I love to tell <laughs> how he led me. And what his grace, I had to get it out, do for you. Then what does it say? I'm saved by his power divine. Saved through new life. So blind, oh, life now is sweet. My joy is complete for I'm saved. 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 
try to make a point, but that just jumped down in my spirit. Ah. Somebody said, I'm saved. Sing it again. Yes, I'm saved by his power divine. Oh, I'm saved through new life. Sublime life now is sweet. Joy is complete for I'm saved. 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 Hold it. That's enough. Because we're going to start dancing. I'm going to miss my point. Yeah, Shante caught our minds. Listen to what we just... You know why we rejoice over that? Because that's our hope. He shot that, that, I'm sa- that he saved me from something. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on a rock to stay. He put a song in my soul today. A song of his praises. Hallelujah. Here's the point that I'm trying to make to you. Look what the song says. And trust me. I'm going to sing this song until I can't sing it anymore. But there's a point in here. At which we stop. If we think that our purpose And our joy is just in being found. Life now is sweet and my joy is what? Hold on a minute. There's a problem with that. Exactly. Because what it says is, once I get saved, that's it. Y'all didn't see that one coming. What it says is that once I've given my life to Christ or he finds me, because here's the point, and it, it, you know, my mind made me work this out. When was I lost? If I was in God before the foundation of the world, then at what point was I lost. Here's where we mess up. We quote scripture wrong. Luke chapter 19, we quote as saying, oh, help me. Well, I need you to, uh, who's up there? I need you to find Luke chapter 19 and, and, uh, um, and the King James Version with Zacchaeus. Because we quote this as saying, well, Jesus said he came to seek and save them that are lost. Would all of you agree with that? That he came to say, would you agree that he said, I came to save, came to seek and save them that are lost? I'm doing a Bible. Would you all agree with that? Would you agree with that? Everybody agree with that? I come to seek and save them that are lost. But would you agree that that's what's in your mind? Would you at least agree with that? That that's what's in your mind. And that's where the problem is. Turn to Luke chapter 19. You're right, Ricky. There is, there's something wrong in there. What would you grace say? Hey, and it's not even the way it's written. Watch this. Luke chapter 19. I need, I need, I need you all to get there for me. I need to go to the part about Zacchaeus, the fifth verse. Go back to the fifth verse. The fifth verse. Go to 19.5, okay? All right? Okay. Jesus came to Zacchaeus, all right? He said, make haste, come down, for today I must abide in thy house. Next verse, all right? When Jesus came to the place, uh, wait a minute, okay. And he made haste and came down and received them joyfully. Zacchaeus. All right, keep going. Just keep going. That's all right, keep going. And when they saw him, they murmured, saying, they was going to be guests with a, a man that is a sinner. Keep going. I know where I want to go. And Zacchaeus, verse 9, verse 9, all right, Jesus said, no, this, he's also a son of Abraham, verse 10 is where I want to go. What does that say? That which is lost, not them. Oh, God, it's the that he's after. What does it mean? 
You're not what lost, what's lost. What's lost is your purpose. You're out of purpose. And so what Jesus comes to do is to redeem you back to what you were supposed to be originally. Oh, y'all not hearing me. Which was happy in the garden doing what you were supposed to do at first. I came to get back your position. I came to get back your joy. I came to get back your worship. I came to get back your praise. You were never lost, but what was in you was lost. That, not them. And even the translators got it wrong. The some of the translators will use the word them, and that's not, it's very specific. The King James writers got it right. It is that. It is that which was lost. That's what Jesus, because you, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. If God is omniscient and God knows everything, if God knows every star of the trillions of stars in the sky, if he knows every one of them by name, he certainly knows where I am. It doesn't make sense. I'm not lost. I may be disobedient, but I'm not lost. But our salvation, you're right on it. Our, sa our salvation is based upon being found. So what happens? If once I'm found, then, then life now is complete. And so, yeah, we, so then we don't go any further than that. So what we do is we now live our life every day trying to keep from being what? Lost. Got it. And we never move into the purpose that we were originally supposed to be in. Does that make any sense? Susan, am I making sense? Logical sense? So, so all I want to do is just exist. And then now I'm just existing, waiting for, he, for him. I want to go back with him. I want to go back with him. I want to go back with him when he comes. Well, he's coming on a cloud. Every eye shall see him. I want to go back with him. Then we say, I want to be just like him. I want to be just like him. Turn to 1 John, 1 John 3 and 2. I want, you start verse 1. I want to be just like him when he comes. Well, he's coming on a cloud. Every eye shall see him. I want to be just like him when he comes. You don't realize how much our songs have determined our theology. Beloved, now! Oh, y'all not hearing me. Right now are we the sons of God. Tell somebody right now. Hey, not later, not when he comes. Oh. Right now are we the sons of God. Right now. No. Y'all not hearing me? I guess not enough people in here to dance on that. Not when he comes. Not when I don't know when he's coming on the cloud. Come on, chariot. I don't know nothing about that, but I know that right now I'm a son of God. And I can be just like him when he's coming. Right now. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that. When he shall appear, we shall be like him when we see him as he is. See, we think of his future, but it's talking about mindset. Y'all better stop me because I feel the Holy Ghost. It's not talking about the future. In other words, my, 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 my translation of the text is, right now you're a son of God. But you don't yet realize it, what you can be, because you've not yet seen him as he is. You haven't gotten a revelation of who Jesus is. That once you get a revelation of who Jesus is, you will see him as he is and you'll be just like him. You can't be like something that you don't see as an image. You have to have an image of him in you. When you thank your Holy Ghost, help me preach it. When you get an image of him before your face and you behold him before your face, then he's reflected in you. And right now when I see you, you thank your Holy Ghost. Don't you know that you are the only Jesus that anybody is ever going to see? That some people will never see Christ? That you are the Christ in the earth right here, right now? You point people to somebody they can't see when well, you need to let them see him through you. Wow. 
So you, 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 you're missing it. You're missing it. Right now, Erica. Right now. That's why, that, I, that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you got to be born again. You won't see this. Not in water and spirit. He's not talking about being baptized. That was the salvation text. Until your mind is transformed, you always think the same way. And as long as you continue to think the same way, you always just be happy. So glad I'm here in Jesus' name. And then after a while, you get tired of being here. You get tired of coming to church. You get tired of the same mundane. You get tired because you're not in your purpose. I don't care what I got to do. And you better write this down. You can Facebook anyway. Say, I don't care what I have to do. I'm going to live life on purpose. I don't care if I got to live life in a one-room shack, but it's going to be on purpose. As long as I'm in the purpose of God, I'm going to live life on purpose. And I'm not going to let life take that purpose away from me. Right now, I was going to try to go, and I don't have enough time. I'll do it next week. I was going to go to Romans eleven twenty nine 29 and talk about an irrevocable blessing, but that was starting all over again. I don't want to start all over again. But enjoy your life, saints. Enjoy your life. Don't let the shantakaradama santaka. Try spirits by spirits. Have people in your life that know you well enough that when you low off, they can tell you. Don't be your own counselor. Amen. Man or woman is a fool when they have themselves for their own therapist. And you sitting there, well, you know, and one of the worst things I, I hate I hear is when saints tell me, well, you know, Bishop, I I just needed a minute and I just need to go in by myself. You're a fool. Because the Bible says safety is found in a multitude of good counsel. That's where you find your safety. There's got to be somebody that can help you walk it through. And you got to make sure it's God sent. Because if not, you'll get people around you who will simply tell you what you want to hear. And they'll feed your ego, sometimes even out of their own hurt and their own pain. They'll talk to you out of what went wrong. They'll, they'll advise you. I listened to, uh, I will not call any names by any stretch of the mouth, but I listened to a great preacher one time, you know, um, give me some advice um, about remarriage and some other stuff. And, um, and as I listened to the advice, I instantly realized that the advice that this person was giving me was based out of the failure of their own marriage. And that even though they meant well towards me for what I need to do now, that I couldn't take that advice because it was coming from a place of failure and not success in their life. So they were projecting. At some point, maybe we'll talk about that. People projecting. Because do you not know why Judas killed Jesus? Because G Judas was projecting on Jesus what he thought Jesus ought to be. And when, thank you, Holy Ghost, if I don't say anything else, I'll get this out. When people project on you what they think you ought to be and you are not that, they will crucify you. The same ones that said they love you will turn right around and nail you to the cross and say, we don't know you. All because of their projecting on you. That's why you got to have, thank you. God keeps talking to me and I'm trying to stop. But, but the Lord has given you all a wealth of stuff that came today and those of you that are watching. The Lord says, maintain your identity, even if it leads you to the cross.
Because if, if your identity is in me and you're doing my will and it leads you to the cross, I promise you, I will resurrect you. Y'all better praise God for that right now. I promise you, I will resurrect you. You will rise again. Put your hands together. I just got to stop. I can do this all day long. I have to do this all day, and, and I just, right down, I'm in my happy place. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, put a smile on your face. Bishop Noel Jones preached a message called God's Going to Make You Laugh. And you know my friend Rodney Howard Brown believes in, in, in the laughter, the joy. When the joy comes, it makes you laugh. And when you really are full with joy, you do start laughing. You, you, I've been in services where you know, we were with, uh, last week, we just just started praising God, and the anointing was so high, people just started laughing, just believing God in the name of Jesus. Everybody happy today? I'm glad you came. Glad you came, and uh, I'm going to let you go really in the next five, ten minutes. Um, I don't know if anybody needs anything from the Lord today, but just apply the word of, of life to your life.